I'm done. All right, three, two, one. Hello, welcome to A Professor's Life, your weekly podcast for all things academia. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Stephen. Hello, all. And Robert. Hello. All right. Well, it's that time of year again, folks, that we are getting back to classes. So we figured this week we would talk about prepping courses, either new preps, old preps, or somewhere in between preps. All right. We will be uh, teaching young minds and uh, liberating minds and stuff. All right. That's what we do as professors, right? We liberate minds, teach people, and uh, gosh darn it, make them better in the end, right? <laughs> Smarter out than coming in. I don't know what we do. Something. All right. Yeah. Sometimes we pretend to teach. Sometimes we actually do teach. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the game of our game, right? So let's talk a little bit about how we uh, prep for classes. Uh, Robert, since you are starting at a new institution this semester, uh, how many new preps do you have? Well, I, I, I have two preps, and I pull out my 20-year-old acetates. <laughs> uh, no. They're yellowing. They are yellowing. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, it's a bit weird because I'm trying to reuse um, some of my basic materials from my previous institution and then blend that in with, with my new stuff. And uh, it's a, uh, it's interesting. The, the hardest part has been getting into the new course management system mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the, the previous one and the current one are not even remotely compatible. What are you using, if you don't mind saying? Oh, so here we have Canvas, which I really like, but it okay. does not play well with Angel. Yes. Okay. So trying to import things, even though it has an import Angel setting, uh, not so much. Well, it's because Angel retired uh, 10 years ago for everybody other than you know where we are at yeah and i think that's part of the problem because it doesn't know you doesn't have version of angel yeah so right. it's just generic generic uh th some things are coming in wonky it's it's hard to debate on whether you i should just do it all from scratch which i don't want to do because i like the material i have and most of it's only a year old so it's not like i'm actually bringing up 20 year old acetates um which i have seen some of them do and it's just it's like, oh, oh yeah, dude, you've been here too long. Um, yeah. Now, we use Moodle as our uh, CMS system, or our CMS. I shouldn't say CMS system. CMS, <laughs> right? There you go. Uh, and it's you know open source, whatever. It's fine. I don't do a whole lot. Well, I use it as an electronic bulletin board where I post yeah. solutions to homework. Well, yeah, because so, uh, you're not a PowerPoint kind of guy because you're doing most right. of the stuff up on the board. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I um, post almost nothing in my I system. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Nothing. Uh, but I, uh, Stephen and I tend to use a lot of uh, rich media. So we use a lot of videos and PowerPoints and things and bringing up cases. And so uh, I do kind of the standard. So, I'm, I'm t so here's a thing, uh, an actual useful thing. So I'm coming in and I'm going to go do case style. So first day of class, everyone's in there. It's the capstone senior course for the business school. They come in and they raise your hand if you've ever done a case before. Two people. So out of 50, two people have ever even seen a case. So, uh, which is fine. It's a different style than I'm used to. But I've come into a business school that apparently does not use the case method whatsoever. So on the fly, I'm ditching about two weeks worth of material so I can do two weeks on how to, you know, read, analyze, and properly do cases. Uh, otherwise, they're going to get really pissed off really quick because they won't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, you know, you come into a new place, you got a certain way of doing things, got to be ready to change on the fly or at least adjust. And, and I had some slack in there, but I didn't have two weeks of slack. Um, so I'm, I'm cutting some material and still trying to fit things in. Also, I found out the week before classes start that the college uses the capstone as an assessment vehicle. So there is going to be a college level assessment done in my class. Um, so at least they you know, at least had a couple days warning. So again, I had to cut a week's worth of material because there's going to be a week's worth of assessments. Um, mainly for its AACSB our accreditation body kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's an actually a capstone here. Uh, at Penn State, 
strategic management's not a capstone. Capstone's out of accounting. Um, so I just hadn't run into that before. Uh, then I go into my entrepreneurship class. And there, here we do, uh, uh, we didn't do this at Penn State at all, but they do four or 500 splits where you have seniors and uh, graduate students in the same class. So I have to come up with additional material and some other stuff for my graduate students that aren't part of my undergraduate students material. And that I also didn't know until they came in and it's like, aren't you a grad student? <laughs> it's like, yes. Why are you taking an undergraduate course? I'm not. Just like, oh, crap. <laughs> so I have been blindsided by quite a bit. Uh, so that would definitely be something where I should have more aggressively sought out that information. But, you know, they handed me my course schedule and that wasn't on there. Also found out uh, two of my courses are cross-listed with marketing. Uh, that I didn't know. So that threw my numbers a bit off because uh, what, what my numbers populated with were just the management sections. And so I have 15 students more than I thought I did, which is fine. I like bigger classes, um, but I didn't have enough materials on the first day. But, you know, students generally don't care. No. So that was fine. Yeah. Um, and these, these are also course preps for things that you're not actually going to teach again, right? Yeah, I actually will never teach Capstone again. Uh, really? So th that's another thing. You come in and uh, I was off cycle, off the standard hiring cycle. So they had to submit courses for me before they knew who they were hiring. Uh, so I was some, so these what I'm teaching are courses that were on the books for whoever takes this slot will be teaching these classes. Uh, here it's very hard for them to do last minute changes. Um, it's not quite as far out as Penn State was where they submitted their courses a full year, sometimes more than a year in advance. Uh, but here it's like nine months. I mean, it's it's quite a bit of time. So I'm coming in teaching a course that I haven't taught in 10 years. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then it's a one-off, uh, which generally, you know, most professors get fairly pissed about. Uh, but I understand, you know, they had to do what they had to do. They had to pick something. Right. Um, I'm just glad it wasn't OB because <laughs> that I haven't done in like 15 years and I don't like OB. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to teach that class. Um, I'm just I'm a strategy guy, man. So, um, yeah. Um, and then uh, I haven't had a chance to, it's another prep thing. I do a lot of experiential exercises and I've started making the rounds now because uh, actually Stephen taught me this one to check to see if my exercises are actually being done in other classes for other purposes so I don't walk in and the students go, oh, yeah, yeah, we had that last week. Yeah, right. The answer's 42. Bastards. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we know the answer already. It's yeah. yeah. Well, so, no, no. The worst part is the ones who have done it already, and yet they still go in there and get it wrong. Like this seems familiar. Oh, yeah. It's like, did you do this in another class? Yeah, I think so. Then why'd yeah. you get it wrong again? It's a team building exercise. Oh. Just like, God, it's a rapid prototyping exercise. Who the hell has it? Oh yeah, Lance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll call him out. <laughs> Little bastard. Um. So uh, yeah, it's uh, just new transition stuff. It's not throwing me off, but. If I was a new assistant, I would be freaked out. Sure. I've been helping the new guy who also got hired off cycle because we had someone um, leave with only two months before this term started to go to another institution. And so someone had to come in. We did a quick hire to fill his spot. And uh, this guy wasn't even going to go on the market. But his advisor had heard about the job. It was kind of one of those things. Yeah. Uh, so we, we got lucky because he's a good candidate. Um who just happened to be decided to uh, defend earlier than he was going to uh, get out on the market. So he was going to take, you know, a lot of people in business will take that fifth year to try to get some more pubs out. And he figured out what the hell, I'll just go for it because there's this position. Uh, so he defended uh, like three weeks ago uh, and we got him and he, he's trying to get in the groove. He was handed an online course, which he has never taught before. Oh, that can be worse. That can, and I think that can be much harder for yeah. somebody that's brand new. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, I have huge sympathy for this guy. Uh, he's he thinks he'll enjoy it. Yeah. He likes the flexibility he gives to his research. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that he spent a little more time um, without student contact hours. You know, a little bit more flexibility you have with an online class. But still, I mean, that's just brutal. 
it, it's a, I don't know. It's an on-ramping to figure out how to actually deliver the content in that way. That's the whole thing. It's different if you're used to teaching. He's CMS, too. He's, he, he, he's not a Canvas guy. All right. Well, you know, online, I hear online um, courses described as all the things I hate about teaching with none of the stuff I actually like. Because well, it's, it's that issue of you don't have that interpersonal communication with the people. They're, they're not there physically present with you, right. but you still have all the grading and all the other, yeah. you know, things. Plus, you could be, you know, a thousand plus students in your little online section. And uh, I don't know. I, it's not something that I ever really want to do. Yeah. But there's a thing here that they really stressed, which which wasn't stressed at all um, at my previous institution, and that these need to be distance education courses, not correspondence courses. Right, right. And so they've uh, got a fair number of restrictions and a lot of extra things that they need to do and an, an entire accreditation body that they're trying to feed these courses through systematically so that they don't, so that they aren't just fire and forget correspondence courses. Mm -hmm. That there's a, you actually have to have instructor contact hours. One nice thing about Canvas is it does seamlessly, well, pretty seamlessly, uh, interconnect with uh, Adobe Connect and several other synchronous tools so that you can do more live office hours, have some discussion sections if you want to, uh, do some of those more kind of synchronous things. And class sizes here are relatively small um, so that those tools don't get too overloaded. Because they crap out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get more than fifty people and forget it. You're not doing synchronous learning. No, no, not at all. Yeah, I and mean, it sounds good. I mean, it sounds better than some of the horror stories I heard, especially the earlier days of online classes, where you know you had these schools trying to maximize their FTEs, where you have you know ten thousand students in one section, and the professor is you might as well not even be there. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, at, at that. You know, University of Florida was famous for having its core undergrad uh, business course on local TV. I mean, that's yeah. how they delivered it. I mean, it's just, yeah. you just you broadcast it that way. It was a way to manage it. Right. Um, yeah, so that's it's obviously transitioned over time to something different. But even when I was working, going back now over 15 years ago, uh, we were working using, um, back when Reel was a thing for yeah. uh, stuff, it was actually, how do you actually create... Uh, courses and actually run through the slides with the talking head and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that was, I mean, this, this material's old. I mean, we've known how to right. do some of this stuff for a long time. It's about trying to make it a richer experience though. Right. Um, something people get something out rather than just watching TV. Right. Passive, more yeah, less passive activity, if you will. Yeah. 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 So uh, what about you, Stephen? Uh, what about you uh, prepping for courses? <laughs> so, there, there's two ways that I do this. Uh, option one is I wander into class and I see what's on the slides that day. Um, <laughs> All right. That, Where am I? Where am I? Yeah. I, it, so it's, it's, it's an interesting point that you raised and press the button. That, and, and apparently I have the answer for it. Um, so that's, that's in the sort of later stage of this. I, I usually have about a three-year cycle or so of, of teaching. So I prep a class out. I get excited about it. I get into a, a good routine the second year, and the third year I get kind of bored and I just sort of wander through it. Uh, I'm in that that redo cycle right now where I'm completely blowing up my class. Uh, okay. Again, just mostly because I get bored with it after a while. And so um, sure. I'm taking what is a 15 class period class, and I'm changing, I think, seven of the 15 classes. Um, and I'm changing the macro structure of the class as well. So I'm just deciding, you know, what did I like? What did I dislike about it last time? Uh, what could I make it a little bit more fun and involved for the students? So it, this is really a you can try something different because I, I just if it's not fun for me, then it's they get less out of it. I think um, mm -hmm. you know my class is so hands on the way that I do it. I mean I teach negotiation, so I'm on the ground. Everything's interaction. Um, and it's experiential. So they do a negotiation. And then we have to say, what did you get out of this? And then how do we learn from that? And then what do we do with it? And so I'm trying to even have more experience than I normally had. Uh, a secondary cycle. So I have like a, normally I would do it as a um, in-depth, full period, basically two-hour exercise. And then a debrief and a lecture on the second class. And the way I'm doing it this time is full period exercise, debrief, beginning of next class, how do we do something with this? And then a short exercise and trying to give them sort of, okay, now that we've done this, so it's do something, fail, 
because everything's set up that they fail, come out of it right. and say, why did you fail? Okay, here's how we work on that. And now let's do a quick learning opportunity to sort of uh, close the loop on that. Because that's how I'm setting up the class this time. Um, but this is, again, it's just sort of a, a, you keep doing it until you find something that that's works and is interesting. Um, but I said, God, how many times I've taught this class? I mean, I'm now at, uh, you know, in the 20s or 30s of independent semesters of teaching the class, let alone sections. So I feel very comfortable with the content. I know the content. It's all about just keep changing it around to keep it fresh for myself and then therefore fresh for the students. Right. Sure. So what do you do, Chris? Um, well, you know, I grab a syllabus, go get the dust off of it, you know, hand it out to the students. Uh, no, actually, um, in, in physics, there's um, a lot. We're expected to be able to teach everything on the undergraduate level, with the ex exception of maybe one or two highly specialized undergraduate courses, right? So, uh, and, a, and a lot of the course material in these courses doesn't necessarily change significantly. It's sort of an understanding, no matter where you are, if you're teaching classical mechanics, that you know, the course contains this particular content. So um, what I basically do is I use a similar syllabus each year, uh, um, but I change the course content largely in how the course is structured. So I'll cover the same basic content, but I might do certain things first, you know, one year. I've taught uh, classical mechanics now probably about eight times and teaching again this semester, and I'm fairly happy with where it is. Uh, and, I'm, and I haven't taught this particular iteration so much that I've gotten bored with it yet. So I'm going to give it another go around um, this, this semester, and then I'm going to look back at it at the end of the semester and see uh, if I want to make any changes to the order in which things are presented. Um, so I don't suspect that I will ever significantly change the actual content itself. It would be more like tweaking, all right, you know, if I do this first, then the students might get this other topic more effectively later. Right, as opposed to hitting them over the head. Where I do have a lot of change, though, are the lab sections. So uh, at my institution, we have labs with all, almost all of our upper division courses, which is fairly unusual. And it's a, it's a plus and a minus. The plus is that you, know, you get hands-on experience, and I get to have the fun of making up new lab ex exercises for the students, right? Try things out. And they're upper-level students, so you can just like, say, all right, we're just going to do this to see if it works. All right. If it works, great. If it doesn't, then we all have a good laugh and we learn something and figure out why it doesn't work and you know we move on from there. Uh, the, the negative almost of it is it's like, like a double prep because you have the course and you have the lab section and, and, they're, and they're very, there's, there's, of course, the content of the course is, um, you know, appears in the lab, but in, in many ways it's like two different courses because you're doing two different kinds of things. In the lecture, you're lecturing. In the lab, they have to figure out lab act activities, and you want to make sure those lab act, act, um, activities actually do at least work when I do them, right, uh, before going through the actual class. Um, so, yeah, I, I prep um, the lectures I keep pretty pretty similar from one semester to the next, but it's the lab experiences. I also do a um, group activity, and they kind of hate this uh, because I tell them, this class is going to be big, so I'm going to have them work in groups, uh, two teams, and they'll all get the same grade at the end in, each, in, the, in the team. And I tell them, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to do anything. I'm just going to tell you, make this measurement. You've got to present it. you got to write it up. I don't care how you divvy out the work, and you all get the same grade. Mm -hmm. And I said, because when you're out there in the real world, you collaborate with people, and you all get the same grade. The paper gets published, or it doesn't. Or, you know, the object gets designed, or it doesn't, whatever the case may be. And this is something that I've been doing relatively new. Um, okay. And it actually was inspired by Robert. He might not know this, though. <laughs> and the conversations that we've had in entrepreneurship and physics... This is an entrepreneurship, but it is teamwork mm -hmm. in a way that a lot of times these students don't get. Right. Yep. And so it's sort of like the first step of me trying to get them um, a skill sets that are not always obtained in an undergraduate physics curriculum. Yeah. Well, you, at least at this well, type of. They're going to be in teams. Yeah. There's no way they yeah. get out of it. Yeah. So I guess to sum up, my preparation really is to recycle an old syllabus, but that's because the course content, you know, is the course content, but it's the delivery that does get tweaked 
from one semester to the next. And, and it's the lab sections that experience the most tweaking uh, because I rarely, um, well, there's some labs that I, I repeat and there's some labs that I don't. And so I have a, a rotation of experiments and then I get bored with them like Steve. So what I do is I just make up new ones. Yeah. We see if they work. So that's, that's the big difference, right? Which is the syllabus is macro structure. Yeah. Um, and then you have your lecture and activities, however you want to do it. I mean, that's that's the rough structure in most of these things. So Robert ha is doing uh, cases. That's a way of doing activities. Uh, I do uh, negotiations. You do lab experiments. But we all have some sort of hands-on aspect to learning. And those right. likely change from year to year uh, for any number of reasons. Either you're bored with it or um, it didn't work in the past or, you know, just for the fun of it. I mean, just pick something else randomly. Well, if we're bored, they're bored. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and, and I'm sure, like like you pointed out, a lot of times the classes, is the content, it's just the content. You know, I mean, there's not, it, at least in my field, there, you know, there's some classes where the content would change. Like my nonlinear dynamics class, the content does change every time I teach it. You know, there's core content that stays the same, but then the last third of the course is whatever is the latest stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the basics of what I do don't really change, right? But the method and that I embed it into the course, you know, uh, my examples, yeah, uh, try to keep more current, right? So I'm not using, you know, stuff from the '80s when, you know, before any of these kids were born, right? right. That they just can't relate to. Right. I need something that they can attach the, the basic contents to. And, and yeah, I, each field has its own thing. So I imagine, Chris, you could connect something with, you know, what's going on with um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, for example, just because he's sort of a something that they all connect to at this point. Right. Um, right. Yeah, that's one of the biggest things that does change, that do change for my courses is latest applications that come out, yeah. stories that come out, you know. So they're still learning classical mechanics, the, the same stuff that I taught. Some of this stuff's like, you know, 200 years old. Yeah. Right, but it's core to the field, and so that stuff is, is, is the same. But you know, I might read an article about uh, a new discovery in I don't know celestial mechanics or whatever, and say, "Oh, okay, well, this is you know you, you heard about this on the news. This is how this ties into what we've been working with." And so, the, yeah, the examples are fresh. That's the that's the key, um, I think, uh, as opposed to trying to swap out because you you could as a professor you could only do so much rebuilding to a course. We have so many other things to do that it's tough to take a course, strip it down, and almost turn it into a new prep again. Especially once you get to a certain point in your career. At least that's been my experience so far. It's too many other demands on my time. Yeah, I'd rather... Uh, I, 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 well, I'm constantly day-to-day, week-to-week refreshing my courses. Sure. But if I'm going to strip it down to the bare bones, I'd rather do a new course. Yeah. You know, because... Uh, at least that's that's so much more fun and exciting. If I'm going to do a new prep. I want it to be a new prep. I don't want it to I've, be a new prep of an old class. I've stripped classes down before. Honestly, I'm not always convinced that they're better. Uh, I, I'm not convinced that I couldn't have gotten the same improvement of quality, or I should say significantly better, I, by just taking the stuff that I already had and just tweaking and moving things around a little bit as opposed to stripping down and starting again. I mean, I've gone down to like recreating lecture notes to the class. That's, that's what I mean by stripping yeah. down, getting rid of my old lecture notes and starting from scratch. Yeah, I prefer to constantly iterate. Yeah. So the key element is how do you stay involved? And again, I, you know, Robert, I, you've told the stories before about how, you know, you'll blow up a class three weeks into it to start again. And, you know, your example today was like, on the first day I had to cut this out or I had to change this or I had to do that. And so you're really willing to re-blow up a class over time and that keeps you engaged. Yeah. Um, and so I think all this comes down to how do you keep yourself engaged? For me, I know I can get away with just walking in there and doing absolutely nothing from year to year, different, and still maintain very high evals. So that's not what the point is. The point is about making myself more excited to be in the room. And for me to be more excited in the room, I have to put more effort into the front end. Uh, and that's usually how that works. So it's, yeah. it's all about finding something that just keeps me going. Uh, I think that's the idea I'm on the prep. You, and I think you do too. Very few canned presentations yeah. where you just kind of, I mean, come in and go, okay, yeah, I know how this is going to go. I know all the beats. Oh, yeah. You know, like you see yeah. a professional speaker would, right. you know, or even like, a, like, a, a, like the old Steve notes. 
mm-hmm. where he he worked in mistakes. They were done at a certain time, and he yeah. recovered from them the same way, and you know, very well planned. I have a few of those in case because I like to have a couple. I think I have three that are just kind of canned in case uh, I run out of prep time or something happens, or I just know, okay, I got this one in the bag. Now I'll slot it in, and I don't have to prep. It just goes, and I know this one works, and it's a little more generic. Uh, so you kind of keep one couple in your pocket uh, for contingencies. But, yeah, it just if, if I disconnect, how, how can I blame a student from disconnecting? Right. What, what I do is I prepare um, very detailed lecture notes that I largely don't use. If that makes any sense. Like I know, for example, that in an hour and five minute lecture, I will cover the material of three to three and a half handwritten pages of lecture notes. So I will write, let's say, 135 pages of lecture notes handwritten to prepare for a course, the whole course. Right. And I'll start and I'll lecture and I'll look at those before class. I'll look at it's been about a half hour looking at these notes. And basically what these notes tell me is this lecture is going to cover these topics. And I get into the class and it's basically improv. No. Yeah. Right. So lots of yeah, prep beforehand so can't. that you have it ease when you're in the room. Exactly. So that I can just very casually, because I have a style of teaching that is very much a casual conversational style, is what I've been told. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I do that by, you know, preparing very much up front. And then when I go in, I'm so comfortable that I can just start chatting. Mm-hmm. And, and it allow, what it allows me to do is if somebody asks a question like, oh, can we see this derivation a bit more detail or whatever, I can go off on these sidetracks and I'm, I'm comfortable with that because it's it's just the style the style of preparation that I do, uh, and it, that works for some people. And for some, and for others, it's too it's too rigid. Like other people, it's like no, I, that's not you know how I can operate. It's interesting because no way. Yeah, I say I just say it's interesting to think about how the differences. And I think we have somewhat. We, I don't think we have the same style, the three of us. Uh, but I think we have a, a closer to a similar style. Because uh, I've heard the other side, right? Which is somebody will go in and say, I've prepped out the class. I know exactly beat by beat every yep. every slide. And they practice them. And I've got a friend who will go and practice each lecture three times before he goes in the room. Wow. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I can't imagine doing it. But that's how he has to structure his life to feel comfortable in the room that he knows he will deliver what he wants to do in the way he wants to deliver it. Um, and that's different. And then I know another person who um, he and, and a friend were going to team teach a class. Well, one structures everything. As you said, Robert, you're giving your example of, I know exactly when they're going to laugh. I'm going to have the mistakes. I'm going to have these jokes. And everything was prepared. And the other person was saying, well, I don't have any idea what I'm going to say until I walk in the room. Um, And so they were trying to coordinate. And one wanted to have every structure of every comment. And the other one says, I don't have anything prepared, so I can't give you that. And so they end up having to walk away because the styles just don't mesh. And so, again, there isn't a right answer here. Whatever it is that you get the good learning from, I think, is the point of this. Find your your piece and find a way to prep it out and keep yourself interested. And again, we're also in a similar spot right now, which is we're all sort of well invested and well experienced in these classes. You know, we've done mm-hmm. all these things. So even Robert, you're teaching a class that you have taught. You've taught it an undergrad. You've taught it in in master's levels. You've taught it multiple times. You may not be teaching it again, possibly ever. But it's not a brand new prep for you either. Oh no, no. And then I'm teaching it my way. Right. Uh, which is going to be very, very different than the other strategy professors. Uh, I'm having large innovation components. I'm doing a lot of business modeling and, and more kind of entrepreneurial things in it because I think that I got to bring what I'm an expert to to the table to give the students better experience and then the rest to just read it in the book. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I want to bring what I bring different than what's in the book. Sure. So, well, and they're, they're all seniors. They should be able to read. Right. <laughs> Yeah, my math methods class I'm teaching this semester, uh, I've taught it twice before. But it's a bit different once you've been a professor for a while. Your third time through after 11 years, 12 years doing this job is a lot different your third time to, through after two or three years on the job. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely true. Yeah, it's, and so even this class, which is one of my least frequently taught courses um, so far in my career, it's not... It's, 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 not a, it's not an issue. Now, if I have a class that I haven't taught before uh, and it's a topic that I'm, I don't want to say uncomfortable with, but just not as experienced with, 
Um, what I might do before a lecture is look at my notes and actually mentally script the first 10 minutes. Like, this is what I'm going to say, right? Just to get yourself and, in the groove. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I may very well spend the first 10 minutes of that lecture doing exactly what I mentally scripted. I was actually, more often than not, I probably do. But by the time that first 10 minutes is over, that discomfort is also passed, and it's that natural conversation again. Um, so, yeah, it's just a matter of finding one's style, mm -hmm. like anything else in life. It's funny. I actually think I do the same thing as you do, Chris, for... Um well, I guess when I go into the exec ed or things like that, where I'm outside of my not not pre, not, I may be providing the same content, but in a very different structure than I'm used to doing. And so that is the same thing. So okay, sure. how do I get myself into the, the the idea of teaching it this way? And after about ten minutes into it, as you said, I'm 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 flying. I know how to deliver the content at that point. I know what I want to do. Yeah. Uh, so that's a great great example of it. Need something so you don't get stuck. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I did that especially a lot last semester. I taught thermodynamics. And it was the first time I even thought about thermodynamics since graduate school. Just something I haven't taught, you know, much at all outside of introductory courses. And so I, I would spend quite a few of my lectures thinking, okay, this is the first 10 minutes. And then just easing in, you know, from there. Um, so, yeah, you know, preps can vary uh, from class to class for the same faculty member, no doubt. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. All right. So uh, I think we've reached our typical time limit here and a pretty good discussion. This is clearly not everything that is to be said <laughs> about course preparation, not even close. In fact, we could probably do a few more episodes. Uh, we won't, at least not now anyway. Um, so if you like what you have heard, please click like on YouTube or subscribe or subscribe to us on iTunes, leave a review, leave a comment. Uh, remember, we have feelings too. So, you know, you know, so just, you know, be, yeah. don't be an a-hole. Yeah, exactly. You know, don't, and, but leave us constructive criticism, constructive criticism. We would definitely enjoy reading it. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter at a prof life. Um, and tell us what you want to hear. What kind of shows would you like to listen to? Uh, what kind of topics do you want us to cover? We'd love to hear the feedback. Uh, so this topic is a preview. Uh, oh, sure. We're going to do conferences. Yes, and now we're committed to we're, that. We're, we're <laughs> academic conferences. Yep. <laughs> yes. So as yes, as the summer wraps up, conferences is a good thing to do. So, until next time, everybody, get back to writing. <laughs>